This is this is Q and A. All right, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so my question is, why did uh, why did Shmuel deteriorate so fast? Uh, I have a thought that like when you when you like you were taking the Torah, you were working for Hashem, like Moses did, then you won't deteriorate so fast. When he was 120, he was still like he was still his, his Shmuel. Son. Shmuel, the Shmuel Navi. Why did he? The, it says in, in, in the Sefer Shmuel that he like, even though he was just 60, 50 at the time, he was like an old person, like he deteriorated very fast. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I heard deteriorated spiritually, I know what you're talking about. Oh, right. <laughs> I'll tell you, the truth is, I'm not uh, well versed in Nach. I didn't spend a time learning, learning uh, the, outside of the five books of Moses, I didn't spend a lot of time learning uh, these things. Why, why did Shmuel physically deteriorate so quickly at the age of 52? But I'm not sure. It says that he was physically emaciated at the age of 52. He died. Hazal say he died because it was time, it was, it was, uh, um, no, wait a second. Let's get straight now. Yeah, Shmuel died at 52. But it's because someone else had to come in. Whether it was David had to come in. It was, it was, and you don't, you don't have any overlap. Just the last day of overlap, but you don't have an overlap. Yeah. So this one has to die in order for that one to... to, to I'm not talking specifically just about that. Also, it's just, like he was the show, but he judged the people for a long time. Uh, and then he stopped because he was old and his, his sons... Start judging oh, in, uh, that, that I don't know. That I don't know, and I don't know. You know, different periods of time have different um, progressions of life. When it, de it depends upon war and peace, it depends upon nutrition, um, reproductive ages changes change ra radically. Um, so it may be just a, a local a local situation. I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, antidote is a good word. Um, an antidote is something which works in the opposite direction. But there's no um, prediction that, that it's um, going to be absolute and perfect. And in fact, uh, this is a general thing you need to know about Chazal. And the truth is, it's based on Psukim also, which people don't take into account. Um, Rabbi Yochanan said, Ein lamedim in a klolos. It means, if you have a big statement that all A's are B's, full stop, you should expect that there are exceptions. They said all A's are B's, but they didn't mean every left one, absolutely, perfectly. They're like, well, hold on, hold on. They say that, don't, Ein lamedim in a klolos. And then he went on to say, I feel the So even if they say all A's are B's except for PQR. So they themselves mention the exceptions. Even there, it's not absolute. There may be other exceptions beyond PQ and R. Even though they mention PQ and R, there may be other exceptions they didn't mention. So when you hear a statement that uh, such and such is true, what you hear, if you're reading Chazal in their own style, is it's true in a certain dimension, in a certain respect, for a certain purpose, on a certain time. You don't hear it as an absolute universal statement. The number of, th of statements like this are our legion, tzitzis, the mitzvah of tzitzis, is equal to all the other mitzvahs combined. Really? Really? For Avodah Zorah, you lose your place in the world to come. For Shabbos, you die, so on and so on. None of those consequences apply to tzitzis. You don't even get punished physically if you, if you, if you violate the mitzvah of tzitzis. How could it be equal to all of them? Listen, the parish says you'll remember them. Putting it says you'll remember them. So since you remember them, it's equal in this one tiny respect, and that's what Chazal meant. There are two psukim where Moses and Aaron are mentioned back to back. Once is Moses and Aaron, then is Aaron and Moses. Say Chazal, Malame, that they're equal. 
Moses and Aaron are equal, hey? Really? Equal in prophecy? That's heresy. Excuse me. No one's equal to Moses' prophecy. So if you look at the context, it's very clear. In the process of taking the Jews out of Egypt, both were necessary. They didn't play equal roles. It was in 50-50, but they're both necessary. In that respect, they were equal. So when you say something's an antidote, you mean it's designed to work against, it's generally effective, but don't guarantee that it'll always work. And if you find exceptions, welcome to the real world. There are always exceptions to what to the, to the rules that the sort of spectrum of two uh, magnetic poles on either side. Is the Well, that's, let's, let's think about that. That's an interesting thought. Um, it's like, like uh, opposing forces. See, the Yetzirah is a motivation, part of your psychology. And the opposing force to the Yetzirah is the Yetzirah Tov, right? The, the good inclination. Those are the things that are opposing forces and motivation. Torah is a mitzvah. It's not a motivation. So to set them up as opposites is a little, a little funny. What it means is if you engage in the mitzvah of Talmud Torah, then you, it will give you protection against giving in to the Yetzirah. I've heard, I've heard the analogy with the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah Tov. It's like a horse and its rider. Yeah. So Torah basically, you would say, makes you a better jockey and gives you better reign and helps you have better control of the horse. But the horse is just still, you're, you're not killing the horse. Well, I think that's right. That's, but let's see now. Let me think about this. Uh, the body and soul, that is the way in which we are given a good and evil inclination. The soul is the item that provides the good inclination. The body is the item that provides the evil inclination. That's true. And as you say, the, the goal is not to kill the evil inclination, though in extremity you can do that. King David did that, actually. Right? But that's not the goal. The goal is to use it positively in your service of Hashem, to uh, co-opt it, to persuade it, to, con to convert it. So that's, that's definitely true. Now you say, if the, when you're told that the, the uh, practice of the learning Torah is an antidote to the motivation of the Yitzhahara, and the Yitzhahara is being embodied by the, by the body, and you think of it like a horse or a rider, and the Torah would be giving the rider better tools with which to guide and train and direct the horse. I'll tell you why I'm hesitating. It's, an, it's, it's, it's a relevant thought. It's a definitely a relevant thought. It's a logical thought. But it, it um, takes out all divine action. It's like a book, of, a book of suggestions. God, God only has the wisdom to know how to train you to deal with horses. But then you just deal with the horses. The alternative view is that for at least part of it, you do what God wants, and then God makes it happen because you did what he wants. So then that means he's the one that's producing the, 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 the outcome. I don't see in all mitzvos... There could be some sort of combination. Yes, exactly. But, but my point is you, you said it only one way. As I said, I said at least in part. At least in part, there's, there's, there's a divine part to it. Uh, I'll, I'll just make one more remark, then I'll take somebody else's question. But this is similar to... An argument I had in my book, an argument people about the subject, when, when the rabbis institute a law which is designed to produce a certain effect, and people read it as, well, this was the rabbi's understanding of psychology, that if you do this, then that will be the effect. And I think that's at least unjustified, and might also be wrong, but it's certainly unjustified. Because the rabbis are saying, God gave us the authority to speak in his name to tell you what he wants you to do. Then the consequence could be, when you do this because he wants you to do it, then he will make sure that that's what will happen. Not that I could have thought of this myself without God telling me, without any divine authority. I could have figured out that if you do this, then that will be the consequence because I'm dealing with just with, with human psychology. At least when you talk about rabbis whose whole life is dedicated to serving God, it's rash to assume that they've forgotten about God, forgotten about Torah, you know. They're playing the role of secular psychologists, and this is what they figured out about the human psyche. I think that's a very rash assumption to make 
in, in, in explaining what it is that they wanted to do. So kashras, they say, is a way to preserve Jewish identity because if you have food laws, then you'll be only eating with other people whom you know, and you can't eat with other people who are a different culture. So that will protect you and so forth and so on. So uh, they extended the kashras laws because they knew that psychologically this would produce, produce Jew, Jewish identity. And there's no reason to assume that. Could be true, but there's no reason to assume it. When people whose whole life is serving God, the alternate view, at least in part, could be, we know that if you do this in God's name, then God will protect you and you'll be preserved. Not that this is natural psychology. Similar to how the Shema says, Mishoresh HaMitzvah, that we should be like Mishoresh of the reason of Hazal. So, but it's so, not so, saying this in our in the, in so the you have to, sense. You have to take into account divine providence at every step. That's, that's, my, that's my thing. Yeah. Other people. You have a question? Uh, I did have a question from uh, the Dermish here. Okay. It doesn't make any difference. This is open. Well, you have to be very careful now with, with the words. You're talking about independence. You're talking about the project of, of uh, creating our own perfection, which is definitely right. But now, <clears throat> we are creatures. That means we exist because God is making us exist. If I have the power of free will, it's because God is creating the power of free will in me. That's not independent at all. Having the power of free will is direct divine causation. The only thing that's independent is what I choose. Exercising the power. Now, because it's free, as we explained, the word free means free from divine causation. So of course it's independent. It's made to be independent. That's exactly the way God wants it to operate. He wants it to operate independently of his power. His power shouldn't determine the outcome. So it is his rotson. I'm quoting the Rambam now in the fifth chapter of, of, of the Laws of Repentance. Right? Just like he wants fire to go up and, and, and water to flow down, he wants people to make free choices. But wanting here doesn't mean causing and making it happen, because that would be a contradiction in terms. If he wants it that isn't, and, and that makes it happen, it's not going to be free. So that independence, that question, is it good or not? Should I? I mean, he, that's what he wants. He wants us to do that and be that way. Think of the definition. It, 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 free means free of divine causation. Right. If you take away freedom, all you get is divine causation, and then you're a squirrel. Yeah, but we say in the next world, there's no such thing. There's Correct. No there isn't. Of course not. Why should there be? It's only this world. Of course. Of course. Here's the struggle. Here's where you're, you're making an effort. It's for this struggle that you get rewarded. The next world It's all reward. So to speak. <laughs> it's good you put in a qualification. Abraham, the first Jew, real Jew, so to speak. Okay. I was wondering, at, at first, if he was about Tshuva, you know, he, he didn't know Hashem from the get-go. So he had to go through experience to understand Hashem. And I was wondering, like, what really, what was this force that came into him and, and he understood and he really realized Hashem was a Bina? Like, what, what attribute of Hashem that what, what, how would you describe Abraham's realization of the truth? What intellectual quality would you use to describe it, in particular if you do it in Kabbalistic terms? Chochmah, being a das. I think that it, it, you see, you're, you're, the questions you're asking is oversimplified. 
Um, facing, let's say, achieving intellectual result requires a strong mind. It requires the ability to make an effort. It requires the ability to focus. Yes, yes, it requires all those things. It also requires you not to be prejudiced, not to be biased. That, that distorts your judgment, perverts your judgment if you're prejudiced and biased. Prejudice and bias is not an intellectual challenge. It's a moral challenge. And it's a psychological challenge. So in order to have a reliably working intellect, your morality has to be good also. If this has a whole essay on this, moral defects are intellectual defects. They go hand in hand with intellectual defects. You see a person whose morality is weak, don't trust his judgment. Don't trust his judgment. Because bad moral traits uh, perverts your judgment, it destroys your objectivity. So I think that when we talk about Abraham's uh, understanding, it wasn't just consistently working on a difficult intellectual problem. Here. He was working on his character also, because without character, without good character, your intellect is not going to lead you to, lead you to the truth. I think that's very, very important. You have a question? Uh, there is a, when we describe interactions between God and man, we classify them into what's called Isurusa de la and Isurusa de la Sata. Where does the initiative come for the contact? And some we say the initiative comes from God, and some we say the initiative comes from man. My Rebbe Zatzal told me when we were talking about this, he said, but don't make a mistake. Even if the initiative comes from man, God says, who preceded me that I should pay him? Because he took the first step before me. So that even when, in this particular interaction, you made the first move, but there was something behind it that stimulated to make the first move. And he quoted a famous statement in the Talmud. That every day, a voice comes out from Har Chore, from the mountain, Oh, woe to the father whose children are not together with, with him. Woe to the children who are not together with their father. So the Rebbe Zatzal asked, what good is a voice that no one hears? You didn't hear that voice. I didn't hear that voice. And he said, your soul hears the voice. And whenever you have a thought, wait. Maybe I could do better. Maybe I could do better. That thought comes from that voice. Now, what will you do with it? Will you follow it? Will you, will you push it down? Will you say, I'm too tired, I've got other things to do? Or will you grab it and, and go with it? But there's always some kind of divine push. So I think that's absolutely right. We ultimately respond. We ultimately respond. And the symbol of this is the ladder that Jacob saw in his dream. The verse there says, Sula Mutzav Arza. Now, Mutzav means set up into its position. And Arza means to the earth. So if it's, if it's set up to the earth, it's not coming from the earth, it's going to the earth. The other place in the verse that's mentioned is heaven. So it's got to be coming from heaven to earth. Right? I think that's, that's symbolic of the idea that contact is made by God reaching out to us. Not like the Sistine Chapel where each one is reaching to the other one. No, God is reaching to us. He creates a ladder down to earth. And then when the ladder is down to earth and the contact is established, we have to climb it. We have to, we have to, to, to make the response. So I think you're right. Always there's something. You, someone crosses your path, someone says something, or something happens to you that you were, you were surprised about. You know, I was brought up reform in America. And uh, at a certain age, I discovered something that they had lied to me about. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. 
And if they lied to me about that, maybe they lied to me about other things also. And that's when I started my investigation, because I want the truth. The fact that they lied to me, I felt terrible. I felt really victimized. And then I thought, well, is this just the isolated one that I found? Or is it symptomatic of more rotten? And I, the more I investigated, the more I found out how much they had lied to me. <coughs> that's how I started my investigation. But that's, for, that's starting point, you know, that first one that, that I discovered that they lied to me, that was the trigger. Now, not everybody follows a trigger like that. So I think you're right about that. Yes, but, but, but that doesn't matter. I mean, no, you, a, a great deal of your free will is choosing how to respond to things that happen. Yeah. You get a bill that you didn't expect. Shall I take money out of the bank? Shall I fight the bill? Shall I ask for, for a charity? The, the, the fact that the bill was not your choosing doesn't mean you have no free will. You have a free will of how to respond to this new item that you have to deal with. I don't think that's a serious challenge to free will. You don't know that it doesn't happen to others. It can happen to others, and they make the wrong choice. They ignore it. The advertisements for Orsamech. Some of the people who see the advertisements come, and some don't. They all got the same advertisement. From the fact that they don't come, you shouldn't conclude they didn't see the advertisement. They saw it, and they chose no. You don't know that they didn't all get in, in, in inspiration from uh, right. You can't know that. Yeah. The state of New York is attempting to strengthen oversight of yeshiva education. Uh, ostensibly, they want to enforce a core curriculum of math, science, and the like. Um, if they stuck to these issues, does the Goyer's government have the right to insist on a population educated in math, science, etc.? You mean according to Torah law? <clears throat> yes. Um, so the question is whether, according to Torah law, we live in another, in another country and uh, we do have a general responsibility to keep the laws of the country, unless the country is a tyranny. Uh, but if the uh, this is brought in the uh, if, if the country is if the government is legitimate because the people who live there consent that the, the government should be should be running the country, then we have a general responsibility to um, to keep the laws of the country. There are some exceptions, if they are prejudicial specifically against Jews, and so forth and so on. But uh, usually we have a, a, but if they tell us that they want to make us uh, uh, stop keeping the laws of the Torah, they can't do that. So they say, well, we've decided a six-day work week, including Saturdays, and Sunday's the only way to off, and you have to work on Saturday. At that point, we say, sorry, we're not, we got obligated by the Torah to keep that law because it breaks Torah law. Now you're asking about their control of our school curriculum. So I, I think that this is a, a matter of judgment. I don't think it's a matter of strict legal detail where it would say you should learn this, you shouldn't learn that, you can't, you mustn't learn this, you mustn't learn that. Uh, the Grove was saying for saying there are five sciences which contribute to your understanding and everybody should have some, some, some knowledge of them. Our um, great rabbis out of the generation. Many of them were doctors. They didn't learn doctor. They didn't learn medicine from from you know from the Chumash. They learned it from the Goyesha wisdom that was available at the time. So I think it's you, you you wouldn't be able to make it into a halachic question of of specific detail. But there's a question of the <coughs> religious education, the spiritual education of your children, and there's a question of Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Once they get this uh, hand of, of, um, of uh, control, how, how far will they take the control? Who's doing it? What are their agendas? 
In the case of uh, the education in New York, we know who's involved. We know what their history is, that they used to be from and they're not from anymore, and they, had, they claimed that they were victimized by the system. Um, I didn't see anybody yet make a head count of, of which population has more millionaires. Uh, somehow it seems to me that people come out of Hasidic uh, education economically do quite well, thank you. Uh, and even if they wouldn't have as high an average income, but our religion doesn't, doesn't make a value in the more income, the better off you are. We don't make that into a value. So we're not looking for that kind of high, that high, high income. So I, I think that um, there's a lot here that's under, this, under the table. It's not, not uh, on the surface. And especially if they're going to dictate the textbooks that are going to teach these subjects, now that will be anathema because they're in the hands of certain political groups who have an agenda of acculturating your children to values which not only the Torah rejects but many, many uh, healthy intelligent, well-meaning people would reject for their children, and they don't care. They're just going to shove it down their throats no matter what. So if that's any part of the, of the proposal, that would be against Torah law, and that would have to be opposed, you know, to the end. We simply would have to oppose it to the end. There are a lot of details that I don't know about, this, about that particular case, so I'm just, these are just a few, a few random thoughts. Yeah. So uh, you know, talk about praying for, for wicked people to be destroyed, and you're asking that if we could pray for them to be destroyed, so then are we allowed to hate them, and so on and so on. But first of all, we don't pray that they should be destroyed. That's a mistake. Can you, could you hand me the uh, sitter? That's a, a very famous misunderstanding. Um, mm. First of all, this blessing, which is a blessing either against informers or heretics, was written by a scholar named Shmuel Akotten. Shmuel Akotten was, uh, was famous for something he said in Pirkei Avos, and that was, listen carefully, when your enemy falls, don't rejoice. That's what he was famous for. By the way, that's a verse. And by the way, that means Pirkei Avos is not the wisdom of the Jewish sages because that's just a verse. He's just quoting a verse. That's not his wisdom at all. These are principles around which you can build a life. They can build their, their service of God around these types of principles. That's why they're important principles. Bartonurus says in the very beginning of the Masechta, he explains that these are things that came down from Moses. These are, these are all principles that came down from Moses. So it's not our folk wisdom as some people would say. All right, so now the person who was, was drafted to write this <coughs> is a person who specifically says, don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Now, secondly, there is a formula in our writings in the Bible for utterly destroying people. That's the formula that Haman used to set up his plan of destroying the Jewish people. The words in that formula aren't here. Shmuel Akutten knew that formula very well. The book was written hundreds of years before he existed, and he avoided those words. So um, if he's looking for a way to say that they should be utterly destroyed, he certainly didn't do it in a very classical, efficient way. And now if you read the words and translate them, you'll see that they don't say that at all. It says, Lamashinim. Lamashinim people are people who are informers. These are people who informed the Romans about Jews who were keeping mitzvahs so the Romans would come and kill them. Not nice people, thank you. And the, and the, the blessing here says they shouldn't have hope. All wickedness. 
shall instantly be annihilated. Wickedness, not wicked people. Not Rishaim, but Rish'ah. This is what Bruria told Rabbi Re- Meir Re- Re- when there were people in his neighborhood who were bothering him, and he prayed they should die. And she said, excuse me, it says, does uh, uh, um, the uh, 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 not that the sinners will be uh, uh, annihilated from the earth, wickedness will be annihilated from the earth. And he changed his prayer. And the Lord concludes she was right and he was wrong. Now, all your enemies should quickly be cut off. Hmm, what does cut off mean? Let's see. And the purposeful, deliberate sinners should be quickly uprooted, broken, um, cast down, and humbled. Now, let's see. When, when people become humbled, they're alive or dead? Humbled, I guess they're alive, right? So it couldn't be that break means they should be dead, and not only dead, not only dead, don't stop there, but in addition to being dead, they should also be humbled? That probably isn't right, right? So probably what we're talking here about is destroying their power, destroying their influence, destroying their inspiration, destroying their enthusiasm, because of the last stage in the in the in the and the treatment is humbled, humbled, right? And it says in the closing the same thing. Shaver oivim, he breaks enemies and humbles the deliberate sinners. So this is not a prayer for their destruction. It's a prayer for their reform on the one hand and also for them to lose power. Power, influence, and control. That's all. Now the question of hating this is a separate question. That's brought in the Shona. And it's a machlekes. Whether you hate the person, or you hate the deeds of the person. That's the machlekes we've shown him. I don't know all the details. I don't know who, who's on which sides. But I do know it's a machlekes we've shown The difference of opinion among the authorities, whether you hate the person or hate the deeds of the person. That you'd have to study it to get the, the, the details on that. What do you say in Olenu? Uh, say in Olenu every, every day, three times a day. <coughs> oh, this is Ashkenaz, so it has it early, okay. Um, they bow to the false gods. We bow to Akkadosh Baruch Hu, the who created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, okay. And then it says, therefore, we hope to you to see speedily the beauty of your strength to push away false gods from the earth and again another word for false gods should be cut off now here's something which I'm going to mention because it's also to to improve purify uh, establish the world lisakain olam in the kingdom of god so, listen, boys and girls, tikkun olam is something which this prayer says, who's going to do? God. God is going to do it. Hello, it's not the words for a human project, human values, human, human uh, intervention, and so forth and so on. Yeah. We are hoping and praying to God that he will do it. Excuse me. Okay, and now, uh, and, and of course, the tikkun olam is that it should be under the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Not, you know, your progressive uh, uh, modern values. <laughs> and all people, all flesh shall call your name to turn to you all the wicked of the earth. Turn them to you. They shall come to appreciate and to know all the people of the, of the earth shall know that every knee has to bow to you and so forth and so on. This whole prayer is about they're doing tshuva, they're reforming, repenting, and, beca- and living in terms of the truth. Does there anything about destroying people here? Nothing at all. Yeah. I listened to your Lag uh, Bomber share online, and in it you, you went through several examples of Sod. And one of them, you um, said how, I don't know if this is Sod, but one thing you spoke about was Isha Isha. 
uh, when they have got ambiguity in this and the hate and these are combined, then you get these patterns. We, we started to say how, how ambiguity is different in hay and how ambiguity is in the middle versus hay is at the end. Um, I'm wondering if there's something you can elaborate on in a, in a, in a way that isn't so mystical, <laughs> in a way that maybe can be more understood practically or psychologically. I can say a little bit about it, but what we're talking about is the fact that the word for man and woman in Hebrew, uh, both words have the letters Aleph Shin in them. For a man, it's Aleph Yud Shin, Ish. For a woman, it's Aleph Shin Hei, Isha. And the uh, rabbinic comment is that since the Yud and the Hei spell one of God's names, when peace is between the husband and wife, then the two letters, the Yud and the Hei, join together and they experience God's presence in their home. And if not, then the Yud and the Hei don't play their role. And then if you take the Yud out of the men's word and the Hei out of the woman's word, then you get Esh, Esh, which is fire, fire, and then you end up with just fire. Um, now, I, I said that all well, that's true, of course, but there's some details there that have to be taken into account. First of all, the way in which you make God's name from the man's side, the woman's side, is two different letters, not the same letter. So their contributions to making God's name are different contributions. And also, the letter, the Yud in the man's name, is in between the letters Aleph and Shin. Whereas the Hey in the woman's name is at the end of this Aleph and Shin. So that the woman's name has fire in it plus Hey. And the man's name doesn't have fire because the yud splits the letters. So um, one, of the, one of the characteristics here, that you said to do it with not too much mysticism, maybe some practical things. Um, I don't know who's listening to the, to, the, to the tape, so I just want to make one preparatory remark. When Chazal tell us something about men and women or human nature generally, this is not their insight, speculations, theories, uh, hypotheses, experience, and you know, so on and so on. Um, this is part of the Masora. This is part of the tradition, it goes back to prophecy, and it is just as much part of the Masora as Philinar, or Kashrasis, or Shabbos is. This I have, and those of you who know who's who, I was a student of, of Yasha Bar Soloveitchik in Boston for many years, part-time, but I, but I heard him many, many times. And he was very, uh, I say, positive about this, that the, the Masorah tells us the basic nature of people. And that means it's not subject to your observation and your theories and the latest uh, psychological uh, non I mean, the, the, um, practices which they've invented, you know, we'll take back a year from now. Uh, that, that has nothing to do with, with, with the reality of the matter. Chazal is telling us what the, what, what the reality is. Now, um, when and women, and, and if you don't see the behavior, it's not because the character isn't there, it's because it's hidden. For example, it says, Isha Dima Sa A woman's tears are, are present in a way that men's tears aren't. Said, yeah, but I know Sadie and she never cries. That's because she's holding it in. That's because she's holding it in. And because of Chazal Rob, she's much closer to crying than, 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 than Richard is, but she's, she's holding it, and it's costing her. So uh, I, I just want to be, to be clear that when Chazal say these things, uh, don't psychologize Chazal, and don't uh, analyze what they say in psychological terms, and so on. That's not where they're coming from. Now, um, the fact that the Yud in the man interrupts the letters, Aleph Shin, means he's less subject to fire, which in one respect represents a kind of strict judgment. There are rules. The rules have to be applied. There are practical consequences. Uh, they can't be ignored. And uh, they set limits on what can be done. You may have your theories, Richard, but you know, I'm dealing with real facts on the ground. And, and you know, you can discuss your theories with your friends in the base measures, but I'm running the house. And I know that this is what has to be done. So a woman is more attuned to a certain practical reality 
which means that a man's ideas can be off base. They can be off base. On the other hand, there's a certain strictness, a certain strictness in the way the woman looks at the things that need to be done. And the man, in that respect, is less strict. He's more flexible, more flexible. In Hebrew, there's a difference between din and mishpat. Mishpat can include mercy. Din very rarely includes mercy. It's not a part of the, uh, part of the, uh, the, the concept. So there's a balance between these two, these two elements. Um, I'll say one more thing, um, and, and here's also something that's really extremely important. Um, let's see, well, okay. Um, there's a, a, I would say, a, a theme. It's not the only theme. It doesn't always work, but there's a theme of, of the man giving and the woman receiving. Now, this theme has to be understood with two crucial nuances. First of all, giving and receiving are not the same as active and passive. Don't confuse them. Very often, the receiver is the one who initiates the interaction, not the giver. The receiver says, I want you to help me, I want you to give to me, and the giver then gives as a result of the petition. So it can very well be that the receiver is the active one and the giver is the reactive one. And in our, in our understanding of interactions, that's the more perfect interaction, interaction that starts bottom up, certainly interacting with God, with the qualification that I said before, that not, 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 it's never the original and it's always inspiration. Okay, all well, that has to be taken into account. But, but uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that... Being a willing and appreciative receiver is itself a giving. Being a willing and appreciative receiver is a giving. So that in that sense, both sides are giving. This Rav Dester has a whole essay on, on Kutras of on, on loving kindness and, and chesed. And um, that would mean that although visibly on the surface, a is giving to B, but under the, to, under the surface, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a giving in the opposite direction. I'll just give you one example. Uh, let's suppose you know somebody who has a problem with self-esteem. So, this is a long schmooze, I'm not doing it now. One thing you can do for them is to arrange a way in which they can help somebody else. A key, and maybe the sort of says the key to self-esteem is that you know that you made somebody else's life better. So you're valuable. You're valuable because you're of value to others whose lives you've improved. So now, let's imagine I know somebody who has a self-esteem problem, and I ask him for advice. You've been to Tucson, haven't you? I've never been there, and I've got to go there in a, in a couple of months. Could you tell me about Tucson? What's it like? What are the people like? Where, where should I stay? You know, are there any kosher restaurants? Is there a shul? Who are the important people to meet? Meet. I could spend an hour talking to the person about Tucson. Now, I'm really going. So I really need the advice. I need it. I'm getting something that's valuable. But what's implied when I ask him for advice? Well, what's implied is I think that he's knowledgeable, he's experienced, he's articulate, he cares enough to, to share his... his his knowledge with me, isn't that a tremendous vote of confidence? Can't he walk away feeling good about himself by the very fact that I asked him for help? So in his giving me advice, I'm giving him self-confidence. That's a lot. A lot in marriage is based on that, on that sharing. And that can be done from both sides. But especially men typically have the, the, the need to be the provider, the one who gives, the one who sets things up, the one, you know, if, you, if, if a woman says to a man, I count on you, that's a tremendous compliment. She's not trapping him. On the contrary, it means she trusts him. She relies on him. She believes that he can, he can, he can help, he can do. 
That's tremendous for a man, and he wants to do that. He probably doesn't realize the extent to which he's being built up by her when she says that. She knows it. He doesn't know it. Okay, he doesn't have to know it. It just works, right? So she can feel, I'm building him by relying on him. And she's right. And that way they're really both giving, but they're giving in very different dimensions. So I think this is part of the difference between, between men and women. And uh, the woman has to be careful about the fire that she has more active in her nature. And he has to be careful about perhaps the laxness, the uh, easiness and the accepting, uh, acceptance of things which aren't uh, as strict as they should be. They have to strike a balance between, between the two of those things. his pursuit and his love of whatever physical things he is, but, but it's now a motivation. And now the youth is in the middle of him, whereas the woman, generally speaking, women do tend to be more responsible and, um, I don't know about today, but generally speaking, they do tend to be morally sensitive and caring about these things. And so she is channeling that towards God as opposed to needing to she doesn't need God to be in the middle of, in, in, she doesn't have to break apart who she is as she turns to God because she's naturally more attuned to God. And she's just I'll tell you, you're 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 working with something that you're really not equipped to, to work with. That's why I'm asking. You're okay, but I I would okay. Uh, you see what you're leaving out of the, your description, you're treating them as if one was on Mars and the other was on Jupiter. You know, that you're describing them as not interacting. You're just talking about their own strengths and weaknesses in serving God. They're not designed to be that way. Men and women are designed to be together working at work. So that means yeah, that... When you, no. when you say there's ish and ish, or there's ish and isha, I, yeah, I, I, that's what, what I are you bringing to the table? What did the ish bring to the table before but he... That's not what you said. Isha, but, but, wait, but, you're you you. but your description, there was no, nothing said about relationship, there was nothing said about a table, nothing said about interaction. I'm, I'm describing, yeah, but, but, I'm but, describing but, the half Okay, you, you're just not hearing what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. But, but, then, but then if you reconceive it in terms of the relationship, you may see that what you're, what you're describing is wrong. If you think of this as what their strengths and weaknesses are in serving God independently, you get one picture. If you think of it as what they're contributing to a joint effort, it looks very different. What looks like a weakness in one case can be a great strength in the, in, in the interaction. So, you know, don't need it more because she has more of this, more of that. Maybe the more that, that, that he has is only which is needed for the interaction. That's why it's the way it is, should be. It doesn't be broken up. It shouldn't be broken up. I, mean, the, I, don't, mean, I don't mean broken up in a bad way. I mean broken okay, up in Okay, okay, okay. We're, we're playing now debating games. Uh, the, uh, and you're not, you're not, I, I, I don't, I don't think, hear. I don't think you understood the way I was maybe, phrasing it. So. Maybe, maybe. But I'm, I'm just telling you. What you described is two people in isolation and describe the differences in their spirituality. And I, I'm, I'm saying that if you don't take into account the context in which that spirituality is going to perform, then you're not, you're not going to be able to, uh, you're not going to be able to understand the significance of the thing. He's like a fullback. He's gigantic. He can't run fast. He weighs a lot. You know, until the sword. He's not an athlete like the quarterback. Yeah, boy, you want the fullback to smash the ball, uh, you know, 10 yards up the foot to make a first down. You want a big, heavy, strong guy because he's one out of 11 members on a team. So you're not looking at him as an athlete. You're looking at him as a football player with 10 other players. So you, you evaluate what he is in a very different way. And you weren't taking into account the role that these features are going to, are going to play in the interaction between them. When you look at them and say this knee is needed and that's, that has to compensate for that because this has this strength and this weakness, you weren't taking into account the way they interact. So I think that it's, 
you're not going to get to good, good, good conclusions if you don't take that into account. They That's all I'm saying. Have, they do have their individual uh, they don't lose their individuality as they get married. They're still keeping that as part of who they are. That's, does, the, does the quarterback lose his individuality when he's got to throw the ball to the pass receiver? But he's got to throw the ball to the pass receiver. If he doesn't do that, he's not playing football. So it's not true. What you're saying, but what you're saying is not true. Let me rephrase. Okay. Let me rephrase. What I was saying, you're right. All right, you're right. There's, there's a theory of how a man and a woman are different as individuals. And then part two is how would those individual differences work together in a relationship? So I was ignoring the second part. Yeah, but you but said the, things like, this is too much, and therefore it needs this correction. But you don't know whether it needs this correction in the context of the relationship. You didn't put that in. So you can't make any judgment as to what's too much and what's too little, what needs this correction if, for that. If, if the quarterback can't throw the ball 10 yards, you're not worrying about the receivers because he's clearly a bad quarterback. Right. Even as an individual, he's, he, has, he isn't reaching a certain uh, bar. There's a certain bar as an individual that a quarterback has to achieve okay. before he can connect. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to say something very cruel. These are debating points. That you're, not, you're not dealing with the issue at all. You're I, trying to I, find I, ways to formulate it so that the exact way in which I formulated my critique doesn't apply. But you're not getting the point at all. Because, when I, you, because I don't feel that you understood. Okay, so maybe original, I didn't. I'm, I'm not trying to win. I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to rephrase in order to Get better get at the original point. As, and I'm not trying to. Well, okay, well, I'm telling you, you're, you're, uh, you're uh, avoiding something that's crucial for understanding and trying to explain to me why you can have an understanding without it. And I'm telling you, it's not true. Uh, that, that's the bottom line. It's not true. So there's no, there's no evaluating a man and a woman as individuals without. You're saying you cannot evaluate them as individuals if you're ignoring. Do you know that a sperm has only half DNA? An egg has only half DNA? So it's only half a cell? It can't function by itself? It can't reproduce? It's something that's sterile? And so forth and so on? That's nonsense! They're meant to come together to produce a, 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 a zygote and produce a human being. So all of this thing is incomplete and so forth and so on? It, it's, 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 it's a, a misdescription because it's supposed to be integrated. Correct. They can't be uh, evaluated. They right. certainly can't be evaluated as individuals because they're not supposed to be individuals. That's what right. they function as individuals. You can describe them, but you can't evaluate them because there's too much of this and not enough of that. That's what you said. You said this is too much. It has to be corrected by that and so forth and so on. You're already in describing the ups and downs, the rights and wrongs, the betters and worses without taking uh, into account the relationship. Right. That's the I, point I'm trying to make I, to you. I, I was, right, I understand, I understand. Okay, okay. 